Mic check, check.
Good evening, everyone. Can you please take your seats? We're about to get started with the Women in Animation panel. And everyone who's outside, if you guys want to come in, please, we're going to shut the doors very shortly. Let's take our seats. We are about to get started with the Women in Animation panel. Women in Animation, urgency to create a sustainable market in India. We will start in exactly one minute, so please take your seats so that we can get started. And that door, if we can also just shut it as well. Great, so this is our last session for uh, the day, and we're very excited. Women in Animation, the urgency to create a sustainable market in India. On this panel, we have Sri Armstrong Pame. He's the Director of Films for the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. May I please have him come up on stage, Mr. Pame? Let's give him a round of applause. We also have Yashoda Parthasurthi, Director of Plexus Motion. Yashoda, please come on up. Yashoda was instrumental in helping us curate this panel. So Yashoda, thank you so much for all your hard work in putting this panel together. We have Saraswati Vani Balgam. She's the CEO, the Creative Director, Writer for Dancing Atoms, all the way from Los Angeles. Vani, thank you for being here. Nisha Vasudevan, independent multidisciplinary creative. Nisha is here as well. Please give her a round of applause. We have Gitanjali Rao, who you know from Bombay Rose and the next amazing project she's working on, which she just pitched at co-production market yesterday. Gitanjali Rao is with us. And last but not least, we have Mr. Mohit Soni, CEO, Media Entertainment Skills Council, who will be moderating this panel. And Mr. Soni, I will let you take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Jatin, and uh, wonderful to be here. First of all, thanks, uh, Ifi, for making me a part of this wonderful panel today. And uh, having the most, I would say, influential people on the panel here who have been uh, the stars of our industry, our sector, and have been defining the way the next generation is going to take this up. But before we go into the lot of discussions and uh, talk about how this entire ecosystem is evolving, Maybe we'll have a quick one minute round of introduction from each of you and uh, giving an insight of what made you get into this sector and what do you feel about the sector at present and maybe in the future. Maybe can we start with you, Gita Ji? Hi, I'm uh, Gitanjali Rao and I uh, make animation films. <coughs> um, I started way back in 1994 and uh, on 35 millimeter. And for me, uh, I, I really don't belong to the market and the sector and things like that. I just independently make my animation films as a passionate filmmaker. So I really don't know what I'm doing in this panel, except the fact that I'm a woman and in animation. But I am really not part of the market as such because I don't make entertainment animated films for children, but I still managed to make my independent films. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nisha. I am a multidisciplinary artist because I work across different media. So I work with film, I direct films, I write, I design, and of course I animate. Um, I started animating when I was making my final master's film uh, at uni. It was a documentary, and once I finished the edit, I watched it, and I was like, okay, this is pretty boring. I got to do something to zhuzh it up. So I taught myself how to use a little bit of After Effects, a little bit of doodling, a little bit of this and that, and I did some rudimentary animations on it, and I was like, wow, I just made something come alive, and I'm going to continue doing this. So from there onwards, I just kept teaching myself and teaching myself and teaching myself. Watching Gitanjali's films actually has been one of the big inspirations um, and from there onwards I've, I've, uh, I've been, here I am I guess and now I do a lot of like tech based stuff with AI and AI, VR, all of that stuff. So that's me, hi. Hello, my name is Saraswati, I'm also known as Bani. Um, I've been in the animation visual effects industry since I've been eight years old. Uh, I grew up with animators in my backyard, in my front yard, in my top floor, everywhere. Um, I ended up uh, getting into live action films at a very young age of 16, and I've been a part of live action industry quite a bit doing visual effects. Um, did movies like Gulam, I don't know how many of you have heard about it, but been there, done that. 
been there, been there, done that. Um, and I was fortunate enough to set up a visual effects and an animation studio in Mumbai called Rhythm and Hues. Uh, worked on it for, I worked there for 13 years. I was one of the co-founders of the Asian um, facilities. And we won several Academy Awards and uh, two or three Academy nominations as well for movies like Life of Pi, Chronicles of Narnia, Golden Compass, and several others. Um, I went to DreamWorks after that. I was the head of creative management, managing the storyboard and the visual effects, uh, visual department teams. About 10 years ago, I quit and started my own company called Dancing Atoms. That's primarily focusing on bringing Indian stories to the world. So I currently live and work out of Los Angeles and I love producing uh, films, but I'm primarily a uh, director and I'm focused very much on doing that. And one of my projects, along with Geetanjali's film, is actually in the co-production market. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be on this panel. And thank you for having us all here. Hi, my name is... Hello? Yeah. Hi, my name is Yashoda Parthasarthi. I run a motion design studio in Mumbai called Plexus Motion, along with my very good friend, Rajesh Rajan. Um, I got into this industry because I wanted to uh, make films, make films which had a lot of uh, uh, concept attached to it, high concept films, and uh, I somehow found myself into this niche of creating uh, stylized title sequences. Um, I don't know if you've seen Sacred Games or Farzi or uh, PS1, the opening sequence for which I, uh, I've directed and been uh, a part of, and uh, now I, kind of want to transition and, uh, you know, so the title sequence uh, career has been really fruitful and fun and now I want to explore slightly longer format because I feel like if stories can be said in 30 seconds or two minutes using animation, mo motion design, uh, traditional 2D, 3D, uh, then the same can translate into longer format uh, films, series, shows. So that's what I'm working towards and uh, yeah. That's me. Hi, good evening. First of all, whoever is at the door, can you please tell all the gentlemen to co also come and join? <laughs> <laughs> that speaks volumes. The hall is only 25, 30% full. I would request whoever is outside, because I represent the ministry, I think I have the uh, rights to ask them to come. First, because this shows our support for the women in the industry. <laughs> I'm very upset that the hall is not full. Okay, so I am Mr. Armstrong. I don't have any background in the animation. I always, the last 14 years of me being in the service, I belong to the Indian Administrative Service. Manipur Carter, only last year, May, I joined. I always felt that animation, let me tell you the fact. When you don't, when you're not, I mean, why would you like to see an animated films and waste your time on the screen when there's so many enough live content, real human being playing? That used to be the thought till I joined the ministry and started exploring that you can do so much more. So my aim and vision in the ministry has been to support, help, and make many more people, especially my boss, my uh, additional secretary, Nirja Shekhar Madam. She has been very supportive in this focusing on women in the indus entertainment industry and especially in this. So my vision in the ministry has been to raise up and support many women that you see here on the stage. So thank you everyone and uh, wonderful to know about all of you. Just to give a small uh, insight about me, I'm Mohit Soni. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Media Entertainment Skills Council. I jumped into this sector after seeing Ek Chidiya and Ek Chidiya. And today when I see uh, Krish, Prish and Balti, it gives me the same level of excitement. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but thanks to Armstrong sir, Munjalji, everyone, for it being amongst the top 10 on the Netflix for a long time. So thank you. I think we should have a round of applause for 
Bharat Aham, the incredible series which has been on Netflix now and talking about some of the lost and or unidentified heroes of our country. Okay, now jumping on to a serious discussion. Yeah, I think that's where we are all supposed to be here. So Gita Ji, I think, uh, you know, uh, while I was talking about Ek Chidiya and Ek Chidiya, you have done so wonderful creative films and I could see some of them being so popularly known amongst the community. Uh, what makes the difference between a good film and a bad film? This question has been asked so many times by so many people to so many answers have been given, but what's your ideology to it? What makes a film a good or a bad? I don't think you can ask directors that question. The audience decides <laughs> what is a good <laughs> film and a bad film. And that is really what works towards being able to make even the bad films. Because if you see the way uh, cinema unfolds, the kind of support that uh, films which, for me, uh, um, a lot of films which have not been supported are not necessarily bad films, but they are films with a political angle or something that does not agree with somebody or has an issue, which tend to not get supported and made. They might not be bad films. Uh, I, I'm talking about before making a film, uh, I'm assuming your question is before making a film, what do you consider a good or a bad? A uh, script decides that. But after making a film, it is really going to be the audience that decides that. Yet, there are times where, uh, like, my short film did go to Cannes, and because it went to Cannes, and it came here, people say, it must be good. Yeah. So our judgment and things like this is still a very colonial setup where we feel, okay, if in another country appreciate something, it might be good. However, when you see children watching a film, they like something that is good for them, they don't like something which is not good for them, so I would really not be able to say what is a good or a bad film for the film. It depends on how it is taken by the person. Yeah, I totally agree it. with you. And I think uh, I remember those days of my college when I went and saw the film called Matrix. It took me three times to understand the film. You know, I have to watch it three times to understand the concept of the film. So I think you're absolutely bang on. I think, guys, you know, a lot of efforts goes in when it comes to making a film. So good film, a bad film, I agree with you. There's no classification. But I feel it's the way the audience look at it and perceive it. Uh, Nisha ji, I wanted to check with you on, you know, like we as a country are one of the biggest known service providers for international projects. What's your take on IP and merchandising in, in our country and where do you see it and how do you see it growing? IP and merchandising? Merchandising I can't speak much to because it's uh, alien to me, but IP I definitely can. Um, I think that for a long time, at least from what I've observed, we have had some sort of animation taking place, whether it was shadow art back then or whatever, all of that stuff. Um, but I think that for a long time with regard to IP, and this might be a controversial opinion, I think we rely a lot on existing mythology and folk tales when there are a lot of contemporary stories to be told and a lot of contemporary uh, artists who'd like to tell them. So with regard to IP, I think we should be able to create a space where there are web series that are completely animated or there are um, Instagram series that are completely animated. Um, and one example of that, I think, is Ganji Chudel, which is one of my favorite memes on Instagram. It's the most badly animated thing you'll ever see, but it's gone there and gotten so much popularity. So I think the thing with IP is not just, of course you should have a good script, and of course you should have uh, you know, good craft, but sometimes you can just have a weird idea and just let it fly and let the audience decide what becomes popular culture. And with Ganji Chadel, one of my other inspirations, um, I think what we've been able to do is see that there's space for people to consume animated content as something that's not a cartoon for children. So that's where I, I that's where I come from. On thank I you, think. thank you, yeah. so amazing. In fact, you know, I always wonder, whenever we go to a, a kind of a multi-store or somewhere, I always see kids buying something called as Disney stuff or hmm. some of the other ones. But I believe uh, India as, as a country, we need to really progress on a lot on the merchandising aspect. And I see that as a big area where I think the new new generation has to pick it up. Uh, so, Vani, while we have been uh, meeting across over the last six months amongst, you know, almost all the events which we have been here, I have seen you 
uh, talking about women empowerment in a very, very big way. I wanted to understand, you know, where do you see the women in the animation VFX or gaming society today in the country? And what's your say to the candidates who are coming in or may hesitate to join in this sector? Um, thank you. Um, for me, I've, you know, one of the things that very early on I've been told as a daughter that there is no separation between a boy and a girl and thank my mother and father for that. Um, when I started working in the industry, very, very young, there was obviously a lot of distortion in terms of women being abused physically. And that kind of puts a lot of fear in all of us because we don't talk about it openly. But that was there, it was the truth, it was the fact. Even in the animation industry, it was there a little bit prevalent unless you had somebody who was watching your back. Um, when I started Rhythm and Hues, I decided to be partnering with an organization in the US called Women in Animation. And um, I didn't realize it until they gave me the actual numbers. So that basically changed the way that I made my decisions from that point. Um, even at Rhythm and Hues, we made sure we were 50-50. You know, even if women were not skilled enough as the same level as men, we invested in them and said, you take another six months if you need on your training program because I could give that permission. Um, so I feel like a lot of stuff, even if you take a look at the data right now and you go and say, hey, I need a visual effects supervisor who's a woman, you will probably find two names in the entire world, like even like award-winning visual effects supervisor. If you take a look at men and you'll see a lot more. So I feel uh, yesterday we were having these conversations, you know, men kind of meet men, they have their evening parties and they make deals. Women don't drink <laughs> as much as men drink, I think. So the networking at that level doesn't happen. So somebody has to be observant, like, you know, somebody really has to be observant and saying what is really happening here in terms of the brotherhood is great but the sisterhood doesn't happen in the same way that the brotherhood happens. So I said, you know, you've got to break this. And women feel extremely uncomfortable standing out there and promoting themselves. They just can't. You know, somebody will say, I'm nervous, I'm shy, I'm intimidated, I'm not prepared for this, I'm feeling not comfortable on public speaking. So these are all the skills that I feel like men should support women in and say, hey, I'm really good at bragging about myself. Let me show you how I can teach you how to do that. And I absolutely have learned it only observing men. Uh, and I thank them for that. Yesterday, I met a very pretty lady, and she said, you're a woman, and you're a man in a woman's body. I was like, OK, I'll take that as a compliment. So you know, things like, how do you promote other women has been something that's been something very, very dear to me. So I, if I have any minute, I will bring in another woman and say, don't struggle. I'll tell you what I can do. Because you have to, because that's the only way I will move forward. So I believe in women empowerment and film empowerment. So <laughs> both together. Amazing. Thank you, Vani, for this, uh, such an amazing support. And I think uh, just to give you some little facts, over the last two years, the training sector in the media and entertainment space has seen 35% rise in admissions. And out of this, 15% is the rise of female candidates joining the training programs. I feel that's a wonderful uh, jump because, you know, if you see from the last two, two and a half years, while the training percentage between male is to female ratio was 37 versus 63, it has gone up by 15% now. So I see that as an incremental dividend multiplying effect, and that should really help. So Vani, thank you, and thanks everyone on this panel for this wonderful support you have been extending to women. Thanks a lot. Yeah, please go ahead. So talking about games, I just did a program of 100 women. We had a, they didn't come with a single concept. Five week program, 19 countries, eight different time zones, done all, all over five weeks. Um, we got women from, I think, yeah, about 100 women. And we finished the program in five weeks. They finished a game. They did a trailer all by themselves. And we just put them all together and they created it. So we have 15 games right now at the end of five weeks. And they're all brilliant, women-focused. They're not women-focused games. They're made by women. And they have a very different way of um, presenting them. So it, it's a huge industry. And we must you know, support that initiative in a very big way. Sure, thank you.
Uh, Yashoda ji, so many films our country does, uh, apart from the big screens, 1800, 2000 films, a lot of short animation films comes out, a lot of web series comes out. Uh, where do you see are we heading in terms of, uh, one, the growth in terms of the revenue which we are bringing to the economy? Second, where do you feel uh, the challenge comes in when somebody starts creating a short animation film? What are the challenges somebody faces in order to maybe gain a popularity or raise some kind of value to it? What's, what's your take on it? Uh, so yeah, to answer your first question, I feel like uh, personally from my observation in the past decade, I've been in the industry close to a decade now, and uh, when I started off, it was like, it started with one sequence and one film and I didn't really think that I'll make a career out of title sequence design because it was so niche, like, you know, and uh, today I have a list of uh, big budget films and shows on my reel uh, and portfolio and they have all embraced, uh, you know, like animated sequences, stylized an uh, animated sequences for backstories, for title sequence, for certain action pieces or, uh, you know, and that started happening also because uh, of the OTT boom and this everything going digital, which is where I think right now we are at the pinnacle of seeing something uh, like a transformation happening at a large scale because India has become digital in the past three years at a, at a really exponential uh, rate, you know, and that has made various kinds of content accessible to a large uh, group of people from various different uh, age groups and sectors. And uh, when I travel in metros and stuff and I see young boys watching anime on their phone and like today while I was traveling in my flight, uh, on one side there was Rocky or Rani and the other side there was an animated uh, Japanese samurai animated series on Netflix uh, being played. It's just like, uh, more and more people are becoming aware of what kind of content exists in the world and they're also open to seeing something new and that makes them wonder, oh, ye to humne nahi socha tha. when we were kids, it was only like Tom and Jerry or, you know, all of that. But then I didn't know that real looking people can be portrayed in animation. And that's something that's happening over a lot of age groups in my personal circle, uh, you know. And I feel like it's only gonna get better and that's why uh, even having this discussion right now in this panel was very important for me because I felt like if we don't tap into this right now, we might miss out because uh, all other countries have always been open. There has been an animation culture. But uh, while growing up, I always felt uh, like the villages in Japan look so beautiful, you know. But then when I go to my hometown, it's equally beautiful. The sun looks very different from what a Ghibli movie would look like. And I love Ghibli films, but I want to see my village uh, or like interior parts of India being represented and just being available to a growing audience because animation essentially uh, without fail from age zero to 20, there is a whole generation that's watching animation every day and we've not been mindful to them, you know, and I think that we need to do that and we need to start small, like, you know, small in, the ter in terms of like short films or like features or short film um, anthology narratives, just because we need to preserve our culture in filmmaking because like a reel or a, you know, a trending uh, app thing might, like yesterday it was awkward, then there was Vines, then now it's Instagram. All of that will keep changing, you know, but films have been there for decades and we always go back to films. So capturing our culture, our villages, our hometowns, our stories on celluloid, uh, celluloid in uh, art form, in animation for me is like really essential. And um, Saraswati has been a really big inspiration for me. I met her like a year and a half ago and when I came to know about what she's doing and uh, you know, it was just like, I met I think some 25 women from the industry, uh, a mixer was just announced and we were all sent an email and I, I was like, 
how many would there be? There'll be like two, three women I'll meet. Let me just go and just show up. And there were 20 of us. And this was in Bombay. And I was just so surprised and so happy to see like all of us doing our little bits in remote pockets from our house and smaller studios, uh, you know? So I think we are at like a very uh, crucial step in terms of like historic revolution. And I think we need to sort of get on board. Um, and the first thing that we need to do is like he also mentioned when you first saw anim animated Q dekhna hai, and I think that's one mindset that we need to change uh, by, you know, showcasing, promoting, funding, supporting films uh, that are animated, that are simple stories. We don't need to do our Ramayan and Mahabharat. Those epics will keep happening every generation. But also talk about like a kite festival in Gujarat or, you know, the harvest festival in Punjab, you know. It, it just, there are just so many of our own uh, homegrown, uh, rooted stories, narratives, which are simpler that I think uh, we should definitely try to put out on animation. And this is sort of like an open invitation for writers, producers, actors to think of animation as an alternative. It's just another medium of filmmaking because uh, with technological advancements, more and more, uh, you know, now every film has visual effects. A decade ago, it was not even like, it, it used to be the least priority in filmmaking, but now without cleanups or roto or background replacement, no films are made. So it, it's heading there and it's headed there and with mocap and other newer technology, Unreal Engine being, uh, you know, a game engine which, which is trying to transition to support film production. Uh, you know, with so many technological advancements, I think this is the right time. And we have a lot of skilled artists in our country who've been working for the biggest companies, the biggest films, the biggest studios from all over the world. If we give them our stories, they would be more than happy to be a part of it, you know. So that's where I'm coming from. Amazing. Thank you. Armstrong, sir. Uh, First of all, congratulations for the announcement and the finalization of NCOE. I think that's a big step. And I should really thank the MIB and everyone involved in it for having this milestone being set. So a round of applause for the NCOE. Uh, while we are talking about this NCOE coming up in Mumbai, sir, I, and this AVGC policy has already been something which everybody has been talking about. Would you like to spend a minute to uh, you know, make everyone understand what this policy is and how NCOE is going to benefit the entire ecosystem? What are our expectations from the partners who are going to be coming in? I think there'll be available insights for every one of us to understand it. Maybe a minute on it, sir. Uh, it's a little early to say that it's a success, but um, the major hurdle has been crossed. It's been lying for the last six months since March. We submitted the proposal and it was lying untouched with queries here and there. So on the 17th of this month, just uh, one day before I could come to ICFI, we had the presentation at the um, Ministry of Finance for the National Center of Excellence on Animation, Visual Effects, Gaming, Comics, and XR. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that, you know, the Ministry of Finance has said yes after m almost 75 minutes of talking. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and Vani may not remember, but remember last time I was asking you what was your take home salary when you left Dreamworld in 2017. So that was one of the point also I hold during the meeting. So, why this center is important for all, not only for the women? Because when you look at engineering, you have the Indian Institute of Technology. When you look at the management, you have ISB and IAMs. But when you talk about animation, visual effects, gaming, comics, XR, can you name me any of the institutes? It's because for a long time, for people like me, we always thought, ah, this is just a subset of IT, you know? 
information technology, small part of IT. We have never been able to decipher what is this all about. So finally, I'm happy to tell you that after over one year of interaction with a lot of people in this sector, we have been able to make a big uh, progress on this. So that's a part of the good news. Why I think that this is important is because this will give an opportunity for people to come forward, make their own IPs creation, and of course, convert their dreams into reality. How may, I was just two days ago, I was just sitting down with Taruvi because uh, I wanted to understand her journey. How did your parents say yes to your dreams of becoming a designer, you know, artist? Because most of our Indian parents, believe it or not, I'm sure many of you, the first thing that your parents might have said is, okay, go for engineers, go for doctors, go for civil service, this and that. No, I mean, uh, they wouldn't say, okay, you become an artist, you become an animator. Uh, that would be like not even in the top five list of the careers. Correct? So now, what the ministry wants to take this forward is let the parents, let the people who are guiding their children see this as one of the finest career that they can ever choose for their children. That's one of the ambition. The second thing is uh, I visited uh, the SIRT at the uh, Sheridan Institute of Research and Training and then Pinewood Studio at Toronto. They have such a fine module whereby if you have an idea, you can come and give it to them, work together with the faculties there, with all their machines available. These resources will help you make your project take you from point A to point B but the final IP will be yours. We want to set up such institute in the country. The country today, you know, in the presentation, we told them that, see, we Indians are doing pretty well. We are a part of Top Gun Maverick. 650 sorts out of 1,838 sorts were made from Technicolor office in Bangalore. We were a part of the uh, Avatar movies by the Prime Focus Studios in Bombay. So the immediate question by one of the uh, official was, Indians are already doing well. Why does the government has to get into this business? So we have to understand that 80 to 90% of the revenues in the AVGC sector that India is earning right now comes from the service sector. That's like, I would say, in the chain of making money, you're in the bottom. Not, no IP creation is there. Now, I also gave them an example that, you know, 95% of whatever is consumed in India is an imported IP. So at least to consume amongst ourselves, let us create an IP for ourselves. And I think NCOE will help create that. That's why we're pushing for it so much. I also gave them an example of, if I'm taking too much of time, please let me know. I also gave them an example of my recent trip to Hyderabad. I came across a very young boy and a very young girl, maybe just 30 or less who are running Mayhem Studio in Bombay. They have 90 people working with them. They are yet to put their games in the market. The trailer of the game is already 18 million view. Last year, they got an investment of $20 million. Their company is valued at $17 million. I told the people in the meeting 
headed by the Secretary of Finance that, sir, if the government intervenes, I want to see a day when every district in the country, 730 districts in the country, would have Mayhem Studio similar, you know, similar to the Mayhem Studio running. We should be able to give opportunity for people at the Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. This is the dream which the ministry is pushing so much for. And, you know, we would like to have people like you, people like Bunny and all of you, maybe in every blocks, every district of the country. That's the dream of the ministry. So, Armstrong, sir, that reminds me of uh, <coughs> one day of my visit some seven years back from now. I saw one hoarding and it says, 10th fail Nirash Naho Multimedia Join Kare. So, after I saw it, it says those people who have not been able to clear their class 10th may look at multimedia as an opportunity or as an option. Yeah, join animation. So, uh, Mohit, I'll just give an example. <laughs> when you mentioned 10 fail, I took the story of this boy also whom I met in Hyderabad. He is a class 10 dropped out. I forgot his name, but his company is called Insanity. He makes a cool 8 lakh rupees for a year by doing the servicing and others. And he was selling his game. And now he employs 10 people. Amazing. I wish all the class 10 dropout people can become like him. So, you know, there's another story. I just, I just want to add that I'm a 10th fail. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Vani, thank you for supporting me on this because the next thing which I saw was graduates nirash now. If job na mile, to media join kare. <laughs> so, I think, guys, uh, the sector is really growing, promising, and uh, we see a lot of opportunities coming in here. Uh, but, you know, a lot of threat we see from technology. I don't know why uh, we feel that artists sometimes get a little, little scared from the technology. Uh, Gita ji, I will come on with this quick question to you. Oh, I thought we have 18 minutes left. Uh, five minutes. Last two questions, we will take the audience vote. So, Gita ji, just quick question to you. Uh, you know, so much of things moving around chat GPT and generative AI taking up a lot of new dimensions. Where do you see this? Is it a threat or an opportunity for our sector? Um. I don't see it as a threat because I really don't write too much. I make <laughs> images that move. And uh, see, I'm not, I'm not uh, going to talk about this personally because this is the live um, discussion which has been happening everywhere. And the first thing you would expect me to say is I feel I'm not going to be required anymore. My visualization is not going to be required anymore. But AI, let me say, not chat GPT, I would think, like, you know, when uh, Vani said, the boys go out for a drink and they promote each other and they boast and that's how you get deals figured out. The girls don't go out because they have kids to look after at home when they come back from their workplaces. And for me, AI would probably mean somebody washes our clothes, somebody <laughs> looks after our kids. Why not? Why are we not talking about how AI can positively help not just women? creative people <laughs> to work on their work a little more and the, the robots are doing those kind of things. We are still worried about we are going to lose our jobs. I really don't want to do a job. I, if, if the state is going to provide for my food and my cat's car food <laughs> and let me work and my robot is doing my cleaning, I'm going to be very happy. So I would still feel AI, the way it is doing things in medi medicine, the way it is doing things in robotics and all are, is, is amazing. For us to sit here and feel, oh, uh, all our jobs are being taken away by chat GPT, let's also understand in the last few years, all our jobs are being taken away by other reasons. Forget chat GPT. Nobody has a job anymore. Nobody has work for the last five or six years. We are not talking about that. Chat GPT will take up our non-existent jobs. So I don't feel threatened about it at Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Answer. So, guys, I'll open up, the, open this uh, session up for questions. Yeah, can we have someone floating the mic, please? Uh, 
Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I'm a producer from Australia, and I work very closely with the Peter Jackson Studios at the Wita in Wellington. Um, I think uh, that the red section women in animation, I think there needs to be more awareness uh, in the Western world. Uh, and a clear example would be digital marketing is shifting to India, at least from Australia, New Zealand, US, UK, because digital marketing in our part of the world is extremely expensive, and I'm talking 5x, 10x expensive. And when you have Indian creatives that are delivering a higher quality of results in SEO, SMO, uh, and changing company profits, I think the same thing lies in animation. I think we are an extremely talented country in terms of creative animation. It's just that we have not marketed our creativity to the Western audience as much as we should. If a man like Peter Jackson, who's created Lord of the Rings and Avatar, and has employed 80 Indian creatives in Wellington, I'm sure there is a lot that can come out of 1.3 billion population. And I don't think it's a flop thing. The studying multimedia is great, and I'm a fourth fail. And um, I, I can probably say I've, I've been part of some big productions, trusted by some big producers. So I think there needs to be a lot more awareness in India. And I think parents, new generation parents, need to be pushing their kids towards giving them iPads and awareness. That's just all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I wanted to take from what he was saying and also when you spoke to her about AI, I feel like one of the ways to encourage people to create more animated films is what if we collaborate just like a mommy or any big film festival encourages any person to just pick up a phone and make a movie. You can do that using, I have been dabbling in it myself, using AI. Now. It's the equivalent of giving someone a phone and saying, go make an animated movie right now. You can do it. We need something like that to help us, uh, help encourage people to go, just go out there and create something, five minutes short, two minutes short, but we need something that can celebrate it as an incentive, I feel, and I wanted to know what you guys think about that. Starting something that gives people an incentive to create and awards them with it. Like, m India desperately needs like a, 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 an award for animation that can be recognized on a global scale. I See, think. all sitting here are hunters, you know, I cannot, pass same question to each of them. So be specific what your question is and to whom. No, this was for the panel because I know all of them are dabbling in it and I feel, I just wanted to know their thoughts on it. I'd, so I'd okay. love to speak about AI because it's something I've been dabbling with, I mean more than dabbling with for some time. I started off doing Mid Journey and all of this stuff. And last month I released my first AI music video which was shot and then run through AI and then taken into like all sorts of post processes and then it came together. Um, speaking to the previous point about is AI gonna take our jobs, one of my greatest learnings at that point is that AI is still rudimentary at this point that like okay it will take my shot, it'll run it through the thing and then I still need to bring it back and I still need someone to help me roto it, to design it and before all of that stuff happens I still need a good idea, a good storyteller and all of that stuff. Um, I think the general narrative around AI at this point is that it's being seen as a threat. Um, and there are certain sectors in which it is, if left unregulated. But in the creative field, it is a tool and not enough people are picking up the tool and trying new things with it because of this feeling of, oh no, it'll, it'll take our jobs or we'll train our future overlords or whatever. The point is that there have been many tech waves in the past before that have come and just improved our workflow. So we can look at it from that perspective. I don't feel we're yet at the point where we can award AI work because it is taking, it's, it's dr deriving a lot of inspiration from existing work, existing art, and uh, then awarding that kind of work just seems like um, there, there are too many people to work with in the I IT just, space. I, I'll just yeah. add very quickly that this year in Annecy Film Festival, there was a film that was made completely on AI. You can look it up on YouTube and you can see how the director actually went and used characters that he used artificial intelligence to make an entire film and they did spotlight it in Annecy. We as India, women, men, doesn't matter what our gender is, have to stand up we have to start creating and stop worrying about what's happening. My motto is let's just start creating because that's the only way we can move forward as writers, creators, directors. So AI or no AI, we have to continue doing what we are doing and 
you know, people like you who speak up in a panel like this is being heard by somebody from the ministry that is taken into note that how can you help, you know, so do reach out to the other people yeah. that are here from the ministry or from NFDC to say, I want this for myself five years from now. And the more of us speak up, the more is being heard by them. So one is what I believe we have seen transistors, we have seen iPods and we have seen Spotify and everything. So our industry has evolved with every technology aspect coming in. I see that AI or AR or XR or MR or whatever technology we talk about, I see our creative guys have invented it and they know how to conquer whatever the things comes in. That's my belief. I think as long as it's creating work for you, right? As long as you are creating work for another 10 people, that should be the thought process. At least for me, that's the way that I move forward. Is whatever am I creating? Am I creating 100 jobs? Am I creating 1,000 jobs? Am I creating five jobs? You have to think more like an entrepreneur and a creative person because that's where you kind of expand. Um, AI is just a tool. You know, it's nothing more than a tool. It's generated by us. It's generated by all of us here. So personally speaking, use it as a tool. You know, Absolutely. it can do good, it can do bad. It's in your hands, you do, you know, whatever you want it to do. Yep. From an idea to, Im sorry, from an idea to implementing it, I, um, what AI is not gonna implement it for you. It'll take some things, it'll give you, it's like having a really good assistant, yeah? Okay, any more question? I have yeah. a question to Mr. Armstrong. Um, so uh, basically in India, the I think the problem is uh, we have a lot of cheap labor. Like that's how we are looked upon as. Like we are, have a lot of uh, people working for Disney. That's why we don't have our own merchandising also. Because we to don't tell our own stories. So uh, what is the, like how much is the budget the government is planning to fund the independent animation scenario and uh, fund the stories because it's it's been talked about so what's the because uh, it's a very expensive medium that's why we don't have that much uh, funding in India and we are working as cheap labors for the foreign countries so uh, what is the government support how much is the support for because there'll be failures there'll be experimentation and there'll be failures so what is the funding that we can expect and like for short films also because it takes a it's like I passed out from SRFT, I made a short film of four minutes, it took me one year. So uh, if that's the scale of uh, production and money we are talking about, so how much is the ministry looking forward to like sponsoring? Because my film was screened in NSC and uh, there I met the uh, governor and I also asked him like, what is the funding scheme we are looking at in Indian health, governmental health? Uh, so that's a little tricky to answer. First of all, let me start by saying I never put, whenever I make presentations, be it at the Cannes, Toronto, or in India itself, I don't want to say cheap labor. I say optimal, optimum usage of your resources. Okay? At Cannes, I was pitching post-production work to a pretty famous Italian director. I told him the work that you get done at Los Angeles studio for $100. You come to India, you will get the same quality of the work done at $30, not because India has cheap labors, but because we're good at it. And the funny thing is, even if you give your work at the Los Angeles studio, 50% of the workforce will be Indians though I've not visited many of the studios in Los Angeles, but in many of the reports that I've studied, Deloitte, ENY, FIKI report, 30 to 50% of the workforce in this industry are Indians, even in America, okay? So I told them, why not save $70 and come and give your work in Bangalore? That's what I told them. Second, so I'm very, a little careful on using this word cheap, I don't, I, I don't want to use that, number one. Number two, how much is the funding? With government, resource is not an issue, okay? You pitch your project well, a minister just announced, we're gonna be increasing. You, many of you must have been surprised, from two crore to 30 crore, the incentive policies, 
it was just announced, this incentive policy was just announced at last year Cannes Film Festival. We started with $200,000, that is like two crore rupees. We were not getting big projects. So suddenly my secretary said, let's do something. We said, we'll go up to $3.6 million. That's like 30 crores. Tell me how many times jump it is. So as long as you have good story to tell, you pitch it in the right project, we are there to support your project. So uh, we don't want to put a limitation to your dreams because of the budget. We're there to support you as long as, you know, it goes through the regular process. And I don't know if this has already been announced, Jitin would know uh, that, uh, I don't know, that 20 crore that ministry has already, oh, it's already been announced. So it's a secondary news, but let me just reiterate. NFDC in the film bazaar only picks up projects and finds and connects people who will be distributing, people who will be funding the projects. NFDC as such never puts its own money. Agreed? But from this year onward, ministry has sanctioned 20 crores. You pick up any of the good projects. We don't care if it is animation, if it is live, short documentary. We don't care. We'll not look into that. This is your 20 crores. You pick up 10 movies, one movie, two movies. Go for co-production, make good revenues. If you make one successful movie, ministry is gonna put many more, so much more. And this is just a start. This is just a start. You are a pass out from SRFTI. You have gone through the toughest screening process. Uh, for people from Australia, I just want to tell you that, you know, 9,000, okay. In India, everything is competitive. So it's not about selection anymore. It's about rejection. For the exam that I got through, 1 million people writes. The exam, 100 of us gets through. Yeah. So for the course that she went through, 15,000 people applies, and that to only creative people, huh? people like me who cannot even draw a simple flower will never apply for that. Only creative people will apply, 15,000 people. 9,000 people finally come and write the test. 224 of them get selected. You are one of the finest talent. You have no reason to hide your talents because of the fun shortage. So all the best. May I just, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to uh, expand on a question because this also is something, and it's very uh, great to hear. But since we are talking about women in animation and uh, this kind of, the fact that it is a very nascent industry compared to the live action and the mainstream industry, in terms of this financing, how much would one reserve for independent animation? And then let's say women in independent animation as um, uh, as a takeaway. I'm, I'm just expanding on a question and saying, because we are in this forum, how would it work for That's us? That's exactly <laughs> my question too. <laughs> uh, I have a little Armstrong bit- Armstrong sir, I feel uh, you know your answer should be very simple here. I'm sorry I'm putting my words in your, your voice, but answer is yes. very simple. Please read the AVGC policy. <laughs> Sure, I've actually got a question for the room and for the fellow panelists, which takes from the phrasing you used, which was cheap labor. And I know you meant it in a different context. Uh, but I do think that there is a general perception of Indian animators as those who offer a service, who are operators and who are told what to do by someone else, and then they will do it, right? They will be told by a Hollywood director or will they'll be told by someone else. At what point and what is it going to take for us to be recognized as storytellers who can do things in our own right? And what is stopping, where is that ceiling right now? And I'd love to hear from you and from you and from you on like where your ceilings have been and how you broke through it. So like this, this subject. 
Okay, you want me to be very specific, so uh, it's a little difficult because we are yet to come up with a policy as such. The task force report is there, but since until unless it is published in a gazette form, I cannot make a commitment. But for people like me in the ministry, our priority has always been to uplift. You know, uh, of course, in many of the cases, I've seen that women outsmart men. Look at civil service. The top three are always women, so including in my batch. Some of the finest college in Delhi University where 100% is the cutoff, St. Stephen's SRCC. 60% of the students are ladies anyway. You guys may not need so much help, but little of the help that the ministry uh, wants to promote. And I'm committing to you this, that if there are equally two good applications and one of them being women, for people like me, I would choose that women. Okay, this is our commitment. We did this for a program which we just completed three days back. 100 applications from Northeast for the 3D animation programs. Out of 300 applications, 35 were girls. Okay, out of 300, only 35 or 40 were girls. We want to make sure that at least 20% of them of the 100 finally selected are girls. So we selected 20 of them. And of course, we have to give weighted to this and that. So it's our commitment in the ministry that we will always prefer. If they're equally good, you know, we'll prefer women uh, to come up in this field. So that's our commitment. And uh, the le level of the funding and others will depend on your projects. No, just so to add on to that, uh, I think uh, ji, I just want to time. add one point uh, <laughs> that we've been uh, really thankful to what the ministry has been doing. But as an audience, I think we need to support the films that come out. Like Geetanjali's film is on Netflix. Please watch it. Make it a hit. Uh, wherever there's Indian animators putting their content out, please also be the consumers because, of course, the ministry's support will be there. The government's support will be there. But we need to support the industry as well. So that's what I want to so thank you guys for being on the panel. Wonderful being he here with all of you and uh, all women who are here and everyone on the sta on the not on the stage but everywhere in the universe. Thank you for being a part and enjoy this sector to the fullest. Two questions, if we can. We have time. Yeah. yeah we'll go okay. Ahead. Amazing. Go ahead. So before we get into that, could I could I just get an answer to my previous question from before? Yeah. Yeah. A question. I don't believe the perception is external. I think there's a lot of perception internally that we are cheap. I don't believe in it. When I present myself, I'm not going to present myself as someone who's there. I've just learned it. Through experience, we all have to stand up for what I belong. What is my value has to be intrinsically my value. As a woman, as a man, a man is not going out there and saying this is my value. And he's cool with that. The same way women have to speak up for themselves for what their value is and not ever underestimate ourselves. So I think a lot of personal, internal own training to say this is my worth, this is my project's worth is something that we have to go and talk there. Just like anybody else does. You know, even in India, we are being told by other people what to do, how to do it. It's not just the white or, you know, foreigners that are telling us what to do, what not to do. So I would highly uh, not even take that into my consciousness as a conversation because that's not the current India anymore. So if anybody is saying that, you can say, hey, we are not that India that you're thinking we are, you know, and a very, in a very polite, sweet way, we can, we can say that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sure. last two questions. Yeah. Person in the, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. So I think um, men really do go out into the world and get to interact with people more as opposed to women who are largely homebound. Um, so I think there's some amount of knowledge sharing that just doesn't uh, get across to women. And I have a couple of questions. One, if women do want to, say, co-produce and co-direct a film, 
what's the process of going about um, finding a co-producer or an investor, and um, how does ownership of the IP work in that case? And uh, are there any specific grants or funding in India? And uh, are there any <laughs> platforms where you can seek co-producers, especially co-producers? I'm actually going to answer that question separately outside this session. I'll answer every single one of those questions for you. I think that's going to take too much time on this panel. I'm so and that's sorry. basically yeah. what Film Bazaar is about. So I'm happy yeah. to sit with you and we'll get all those answered. Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much. Shamal, do you have a question? The AVGC policy. I, I, I really like you. I want to work with you. Thank you so much for bringing Love it up. It. <laughs> I was. I do want to say that there is a task force that has been made for the animation sector. And I think every woman that's in this room should please meet Priyanka later. And I want to recommend all of you women to be a part of that sector and create a woman force that is talking about women. I don't think we as women need to sit back and say, let somebody else decide what the task force should be. I think we should absolutely speak up, sign up, and then make things happen. Great. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stop this panel at this point. I want to end with some good news, which is we have an animated film in our viewing room called Return to the Jungle. Um, so if you, are, if you do have access to the viewing room, please check out that film. It's also part of Film Bazaar Recommends this year, um, and we're very excited about that. Uh, we also have a special surprise for you from our digital collectibles team from NFBC. They are here to make a very important announcement about NFTs that NFBC has created specifically for, um, for you know, uh, investment. So I would ask that Balaji and Vishaka ma'am, please come up on stage and reveal that information to this audience. Good evening all. Good evening dignitaries of the dais. <laughs> uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, discussion. Um, I mean, there was a lot to learn from you all. Thank you. And uh, at can you play on that slide, please? Yeah. So uh, basically, in the SIFI, we are launching one-of-a-kind digital collectible. So it is uh, our team in NFDC. We have come up with this digital collectible. So as a Q&A basis, I'll be asking my uh, team member, Ms. Vishaka, uh, a few questions which will be helping a lot of people here. I request uh, the elite panelists here also to uh, take part in it for just a couple of minutes. Thank you. So thank you, Balaji, for uh, bringing the attention to this. And I don't think this conversation couldn't, uh, you know, would have timed better uh, because the conversation that we've been having so far is about animations and technology, etc. And I feel to address these questions, blockchain uh, technology is a major solution provider. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with blockchain, but a lot of times people think blockchain is similar to non-fungible tokens, which is similar to cryptocurrencies, which it is not. Blockchain is the underlying technology which is immutable, and it is the future of the internet, on which a lot of IPs are getting registered. Now, as lay pe persons, we don't really need to understand the depth of the technology. We just intend to use it. And what the if IFI DC, which is the IFI's first iconic historical launch of its digital collectibles is about is, it's a collection of 2023 collectibles which offer uh, exclusive access to benefits at the National Film Archive of India, at the National Museum of Indian Cinema, access to IFI 2024 if you own one of these collectibles. And as of now, we have only unveiled 200 limited collectibles, which means if you buy this digital collectible, this piece of art, by the way, it is not AI generated. Uh, it has been created by this wonderful artist called Hari Krishnan from Kerala, who's also a filmmaker, who is a self-taught artist who created this beautiful piece of artwork. It's actually an audio-visual um, beautiful file that you get. Uh, and he created it within three days. Uh, not cheap labor. Uh, 
definitely worth every, every penny that you spend buying this beautiful piece of artwork and getting access to these amazing utilities. Our technology partner has been Guardian Link. They are the same people who launched uh, Mr. Bachchan's digital collectibles a few years ago and have also worked with Stan Lee's uh, Chakra uh, NFT collections as well. Now, anybody who's interested in accessing this, th these beautiful pieces of digital collectibles, you can go to the, if you go our website, there'll be a digital collectible section there. Uh, you can just go to the page and collect the, the collectible that you wish to. Uh, talking of the issues that we were just discussing in terms of IPs, uh, you know, I know AI is, uh, the, the, you know, I, I love, I think one of us just made a comment that AI is supposed to just help us do our job better. Uh, at IFI, the intention at this point in time is that this is an experiment, yes, we, are, we have a vision of experimenting with blockchain. It has proven to give, you know, a lot of successful use cases abroad. Uh, the whole idea is to, at some point in time, have our own blockchain, if all goes well, and then have all of us creators with our IPs registering our IP on blockchain for the very first time, ensuring that there is no more conflict of whose IP is it anyway, you know? Uh, so that is something that we're looking at doing. But the starting point is a digital collectible. So I hope you all find the time to go to Ifigoa's website or probably just scan this QR code and have a look at the artwork. Thank you so much. Thank you. If uh, the panelists have any queries about our project, it'll help us a lot to clarify it to the audience. Let's give it up for Vishakha team. Vishakha team. So Let's give it up for Vishakha team, designer of this you know, blockchain. When Balaji told me day before yesterday about this NFT. My first question was, who is designing the blockchain? Because you cannot design it. <laughs> <laughs> so, great. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say that I've been an actor and I'm a film producer. I'm a non-techie and I understand blockchain. And if I can, anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, all. So on, on that note, we conclude this panel. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Thank you all so much for your time and your energy. Can we get a quick photo of all of our panelists together, please? And just to remind you all, we do have a lawn party that Film Bazaar is presenting every night. We have our nightly lawn party, so please join us. I know and all of you are new to Film Bazaar, and that is something that we do every single year. So your actual uh, badge will get you into those lawn parties. We'll see you this evening on the lawn. Thank you all so much. <laughs>